Chapter Four of The Thing from the Lake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Thing from the Lake by Eleanor M. Ingram. Chapter Four. Fair speech is more rare than the emeralds found by slave maidens on the pebbles. Patahotep. At ten o'clock next morning. I was summoned from my sleep by the bell of the telephone beside my bed. It was not a pleasant sleep, although I had not returned to my apartment until dawn. Nightmare doubts galloped ruthless hooves over any repose. Phillida's voice came over the wire to me like the morning song of a bird. "'Good morning, Cousin Roger. We are going to take the train in a few moments.' but I could not leave New York without telling you how happy I am. Are you... did I wake you up? I was afraid that I might, but Ethan said you would like me to call even so. My dear, it was the kindest thought you ever had, I told her fervently. Was it? she hesitated. Then... were they pretty dreadful to you at home? Quite. Do you suppose they will do anything dreadful about us? No, nothing. It did not seem necessary to tell her that Aunt Caroline did not know where the runaways had gone, and was thereby debarred from hasty action. Phillida's father had privately agreed with me in this. I am so very happy, Cousin Roger. I am glad, Phil. And you will come to the farm soon? Soon, I promised. So the nightmares of immediate anxiety for her galloped themselves away, routed for that time. Like my goldfish, when their bowl has been unduly shaken, I sank down again into the quieted waters of my little world and absorption in my own affairs. There have been hours when I wondered if I was of more importance than they, as a matter of cosmic fact. A month passed before I kept my promise to go to the farm in Connecticut. As a first reason, I wanted to leave my young couple alone for a period of adjustment. Also, I was curious to see how they would handle the business left to them. I held telephone conversations with Phillida and with various contractors now and then. I sent out the furnishings for my own room. Everything else I purposely left to the experimenters. There was a second reason, more obscure. I wanted to keep for a while the little mystery of the lady who had come to the farmhouse room in the dark of the night. She was pure romance, a rare incident in a prosaic age. My table had been bare of such delicately spiced morsels, and I relished the savor of this one upon my palate. I was not quite ready to find her in the matter-of-fact daughter of some neighbor who had sought shelter from the storm in that supposedly empty house and probably mistaken me for a tramp. Perhaps I was equally reluctant to go back and prove that the adventure was ended, that she had been a bird of passage who had gone on with no thought of return. With all these delays, and the fact that my work really kept me busy in town, April was verging toward May when I finally saw the last of my luggage put into the car and started on my fifty-mile drive to the house by the lake. I did not take this first visit very seriously, or intend it to be over long. To be a constraint upon the household I had established, or assume a right there, was far from the course I planned. It was not certain Vere and I would be comfortable housemates. But to stay away together would have hurt Phillida as much as to stay too long, I considered. Probably a week would be about enough for this time. So lightly, so ignorantly, I stepped from the first great division of my life into the second, not hearing the closing of the gate through which there was no turning back. End of chapter 4 Recording by Roger Moline